webinars are made possible thanks to generous donor support. If you'd like to contribute, please visit our website, autism.org. Now, before we get started, I'll introduce our speaker. Dr. Kenneth Bach has lectured nationally and internationally for the past three decades on a broad range of topics. His lecture topics have included integrative approaches to immune system imbalances and disorders, detoxification and the treatment of complex chronic illness, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, autoimmune disorders, and the integrative treatment of children's mood disorders, pans and pandas, autism, ADHD, asthma, and allergies. And now I'll turn this over to Dr. Buck. Thank you, Denise. It's my pleasure to be here. And for everybody watching, it's, um, it's my pleasure to be with, uh, with all of you. I'm going to talk about a topic that's uh, very dear to my heart. Um, and that I think I, I, I hopefully when you finish, if you've already had questions before we start, hopefully if you have some questions as we go through, I'll be able to answer them for you. Now, usually if I was in a room lecturing to you, I could ask a question, how many of you have kids in the autism spectrum? And probably most of you, you know, would raise your hands. And then I may say, how many, you have other siblings, other children, siblings of the child with autism who might have some mood disorders, anxiety, depression, mood dysregulation, uh, OCD, et cetera. And um, I imagine, and even ADHD, uh, which is not a mood disorder, but is in kind of uh, this arena. And I imagine many of you, if not all of you, would probably raise your hand. So uh, what I'm going to try to do today uh, is tie together some of the work that I've done with, in autism spectrum disorders for all these years. I've been uh, seeing thousands of kids in the spectrum uh, since the late 90s. Um, and also... Uh, the more recent work I'm doing with uh, neurotypical kids with anxiety, depression, OCD, and other mood disorders. This is just saying that uh, the slides um, can't be used without my permission. All right, so let's start. The Basically, in terms of, uh, this is a figure that just shows the five most common psychiatric disorders worldwide. Obviously, we see what is the spectrum disorder here. This is worldwide. Uh, as uh, many of you are probably aware the incidence of autism has increased greatly over the last several decades to a place where it's now just about 2% of kids are diagnosed with autism or about 1 in 146 to 1 in 150, something like that. And yet you see here also um, many of the other mood disorders worldwide where we see uh, anxiety, the highest major depression also extremely high and then bi bipolar disorders and schizophrenia. So what I'm gonna talk today is, is the this whole issue of brain inflammation, what we call neuroinflammation, and how it pertains to the autism spectrum disorders as well as all these other disorders. And it should be noted that by working with autism spectrum disorders for, for over two decades, um, it, it was the recognition of neuroinflammation and looking for things underneath that were contributing, it's in kind of the integrative medicine approach that I have that actually uh, had me start in the field. And um, I gave a lecture at an autism conference, a Dan conference actually in 1998 and uh, about some uh, immune modulation and transfer factors. Uh, a lot of parents started bringing their kids and they started getting better with this integrative medicine approach and suddenly kids started coming from all over the country and all over the world. And by now I've seen thousands and thousands of kids in this spectrum. But as that happened, I saw more and more of the families, the, the siblings who may have been neurotypical, but had mood disorders, anxiety, depression, uh, bipolar disorder, mood dysregulation, OCD. And as I started to treat them, uh, with a similar approach, which I'm going to review with you in, in, in a minute, um, I started to have more and more of neurotypical kids come with these disorders. 
and that's why after I wrote my uh, the book on uh, uh, the four A's, healing the new childhood epidemics, um, in that period of time between 2007 and now to this new book that's come out, Brain and Flame, I've had a chance over the last decade to really work with a lot of neurotypical kids with these mood disorders, and that's kind of what I want to share with you today. So one of the breakthroughs in working with autism spectrum uh, disorder was in this article in 2005. This is one of those landmark Sentinel articles from Hopkins, John Hopkins, uh, uh, by Vargas, Pardo et al., about neuroglial activation and neuroinflammation in the brain of patients with autism. And basically they showed uh, from taking biopsies of brains of 11 kids with autism that had died, and then also from uh, the cerebrospinal fluid uh, analysis from six living autistic patients for cytokines, which are these immune messenger molecules, they demonstrated an active neuroinflammatory process in various parts of the brain, the cerebral cortex, the white matter, and the cerebellum of autistic patients. And then their studies also showed marked activation of microglia and astroglia. These are the supporting cells to the neurons in the brain, and the microglia specifically are the immune cells in the brain. And when they're activated and upregulated, they produce a whole uh, cadre of pro-inflammatory immune messenger molecules that we call cytokines, and they showed this. Well, um, and their conclusion was suggested that future therapies might involve modifying neuroglial responses in the brain. And this is a very powerful conclusion. This article was incredible, and I remember us at our conferences. This really set us on a path to figure out uh, just uh, how we could modulate that neuroinflammatory process. Um, and you're going to see that that's progressed over the years for sure. This you're talking about 15, 16 years ago. Then uh, seven years after that, this, the esteemed New York Times uh, medical uh, publication um, by Moises Velasquez Manoff talked about an immune disorder and specifically immune dysregulation at the root of autism in a subset. Maybe he thought maybe a third. I think it's actually quite more than that. He talked about inflammation, immune dysregulation, and it actually may start in the womb, interestingly enough. So there have been many articles published since about uh, inflammation and immune dysregulation in ASD with two, you know, basically showing that two of the prominent clinical features of ASD are inflammation and a neuroimmune system dysregulation with increased cytokine. Again, these are immune messenger molecules, just like neurotransmitters in the nervous system and hormones in the endocrine system. This is cytokines or immune messenger molecules. And you're, you're not going to get quizzed on this. You don't have to worry about the IL-1 beta and IL-6 and IL-8 and IL-12. Um, various of these pro-inflammatory cytokines and other studies showing IL-17, again, IL-6, and tumor necrosis factor alpha. So I want you, if anything, to take away tumor necrosis factor alpha is a very, very pro-inflammatory cytokine immune messenger molecule that is significantly upregulated in ASD. And you can see increased peripheral concentrations of <clears throat> tumor necrosis factor alpha and S100B, which is a protein from astroglia, which I'm going to talk about later when I talk about the blood-brain barrier. And interestingly enough, higher levels of tumor necrosis factor alpha were seen in patients with moderate severity, uh, not as much to milder severity, and tumor necrosis factor alpha levers, levels were positively correlated with ASD severity. And here's just a graphic showing you that elevations in, in, uh, in ASD patients of tumor necrosis factor alpha on the right, and also S100B, which is a protein, again, that reflects disruption of the blood-brain barrier. And so again, some of these things can be uh, activated immune systems in the mother that can result in ASD. Um, and, they, and the mother can have a maternal antibodies to actually fetal brain. Uh, I remember I said there's elevation of inflammatory cytokines in the blood and brain, upregulation uh, of the microglia, the immune cells in the brain, 
children with ASD can have autoantibodies to brain. In other words, they can have antibodies to their own brain tissue, which you're not supposed to have. And uh, the children with autoantibodies are reported to have a more severe form of ASD. And here's another article basically showing that the, the different immune subphenotypes, in other words, how they present uh, with immune abnormalities within the ASD population, it may correlate with more severe behavioral impairments when there is immune dysregulation. Okay. So one of the main things that I and a number of my colleagues that we used to meet, uh, uh, we, we still meet every year in a think tank. We did not meet last year because of unfortunately COVID, um, hoping there will be, there will be uh, an apparent virtual meeting uh, this year but it's about 40 or 50 of us from around the country and uh, occasionally from around the world who are trying to meet uh, regularly to try to solve the puzzle uh, of autism. And it's always been uh, supported and gotten and uh, sponsored by uh, Autism Research Institute. We've both been thankful for it. I always look forward to it. It's some brilliant minds and a lot of exchange of ideas. But one of the things we recognized to help the kids with autism was that we were most effective if we subtyped them or put them in subgroups. And there were several subgroups and they're not um, particular that you only can have one. There's a lot of overlap, but uh, one of the foremost ones is the gut and the gut brain uh, subgroup, then immune dysfunction and immune dysregulation is a huge subgroup. And that can include immune deficiency, autoimmunity, uh, allergy sensitivities and more than just the gut brain, a gut immune brain axis dysregulation. And there are infections of all types, viruses, bacteria, it could be strep, anaerobic bacteria, fungi like candida or yeast, and parasites. And further subtypes sub include metabolic imbalances, enzyme dysfunction, mitochondrial dysfunction, uh, imbalances not only in the immune system and the metabolism, but nutritional imbalances, hormonal imbalances, uh, the thyroid especially, but the adrenal, and uh, toxicants, heavy metals, chemicals, for example. So these are all the things, and if we could actually look at a, an autistic child and figure out which of the subgroups were important in that particular child, what, what I do in my office is one of my uh, friends uh, and uh, patients uh, once uh, said, look under the hood. Uh, of each child and figure out what is happening. And then, of course, when you can figure that out, there's a lot of overlap here, you can figure out where to go to treat. So now if you move uh, from the autism spectrum uh, right now, and, and, and you'll see it, it'll come back in as I show overlap between these, let's look at the increasing prevalence of mental health disorders in adolescents and teens these days with some pretty staggering facts. And listen, the first fact of autism spectrum disorder being diagnosed in approximately 2% of uh, children in the U.S. is, to me, staggering. You know, one in 46, one in 50, it's, it's crazy. But, you know, you know, 30, 40 years ago, it was one in 5,000 uh, conservatively. So by the time they turn 18, now we're talking about neurotypical kids. By the time they turn 18, as many as 50% of all children and teens will meet the diagnostic criteria for at least one mental health disorder. Uh, five times as many high school and college students today say they're dealing with anxiety and other health disorders, as did young people of the same age when they were surveyed during the Great Depression. And anxiety, which manifests as social anxiety, separation anxiety, or phobias, among other symptoms, is the most prevalent diagnosis affecting as many as one third of adolescents. And you saw how big that was worldwide, how big the, uh, the uh, anxiety subgroup was in terms of mental health disorders. And there are many factors that contribute to chronic stress in adolescents. And these include peer pressure, uh, increased pressure to perform in schoolwork and sports. I think that uh, kids are uh, less being able to just be kids. And there's all this, you know, you know, you know get this tutor, be on, be on this, perform on this team, um, do, 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 excel, 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 rather than sometimes letting kids just be kids. And, you know, I would say when we got home from school, we do our homework and then we just go out and play around and screw off as kids and just be kids. And I think that that's, that's changed in this day and age. There's a real push. I mean, in New York City, you know, even before kids are conceived, but certainly when they're conceived and then 
when they're, they're infants and very young, the parents are figuring out how to get them into the ma into you know the major preschools and kids are getting prepped for that and, and they're getting tested before they go to preschool. It's a little crazy for kids that young to not just be able to be kids. And I understand the importance of performance and obviously uh, as a professional, I understand that very well, but there is something about kids just being kids. And there's bullying and cyberbullying. There's FOMO, fear of missing out. And there's a the whole social instability due to a sense of vulnerability in foundational institutions like school and houses of worship. Hey, we just had a mass uh, shooting in, 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 I think it was a grocery store. It's just, it's, 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 it's a little bit crazy and kids are definitely more stressed than they've ever been. So you add to these increased, uh, the, all these stresses, the increased pandemic related isolation and loneliness. And it's no wonder our teens are cauldrons of brewing and overflowing angst. And this uh, schematic, which shows that, it, it shows, uh, it's taken from uh, the, the, my new book, Brain Inflamed. And basically it's showing um, at the basis of this cauldron are genetic predispositions, which we all have different layers. So we're, we're gonna be lower or higher, depending on what we inherit from our parents. And then there are all these layers, <clears throat> other than just the psychosocial factors and stress, there's nutritional imbalances, allergies and sensitivities, hormonal imbalance, toxicants, all kinds of infectious agents. And the psychosocial stress is frequently the thing that causes the collagen to boil over, but we can't forget about the other layers because the lower we can sit in the kettle or this collagen as, as it's depicted here, the more stress we'll be able to uh, accommodate before we boil over. And just to be clear, I'm gonna be talking about <clears throat> neuroinflammation in mood disorders, but sometimes anxiety and depression in adolescents and teens is exactly that, anxiety and depression or panic attacks, related mainly to psychosocial factors, including the increased stressors just listed, a, a teen goes through a, a harsh breakup, uh, you know, or is bullied. And sometimes that drives them to really experience symptoms and there are not all the other things I just showed, but we need to look, we need to be aware that all these other things can contribute to mood disorders without just saying it's all psychological, it's all psychosocial. So as I just said, there may be other psychological behavior symptoms, uh, uh, including OCD, panic attacks, mood dysregulation with episodic rage, and even psychotic thoughts. And the symptoms, just like on the autism spectrum, you can have mild to moderate to severe symptoms with mood disorders may be mild to moderate to severe. Uh, one of the clues, they may not respond adequately to psychotropic medications and or psychotherapy, including cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT. At least 30% of depression doesn't respond to antidepressants. So in these situations, it may not be that straightforward in other words, it may not be purely psychological, but rather something may be related to underlying medical slash biological conditions. And this is what I really uh, want to bring out and have people be aware of. Because you, if you have these other medical biological issues going on, all the psychotropic meds and all the psychotherapy in the world is not gonna get that kid better. And that is one of the, the take homes I want you to, to get from this lecture. So, interestingly enough, when we look at potential underlying medical biological factors to consider in these mood disorders, right, it's very similar to what I showed you in terms of the subgroups of autism spectrum disorders. Gut dysbiosis, imbalanced uh, flora in the gut and the Florence microbiota. We hear a lot about that these days, the microbiome, infections of all kinds, Lyme disease, and all the co-infections associated with tick-borne diseases. Autoimmunity that, you know, PANS, PANDAS, or what I call uh, also infection-triggered autoimmune brain inflammation, a TABI. And these infections can be strep, they can be mycoplasma, they can be viruses. Uh, so it's, and they can, of course, be the tick-borne as well. Uh, hormonal imbalances, uh, autoimmune Hashimoto's thyroiditis with hypothyroidism, something we have to be aware of, and adrenal dysfunction, another hormonal imbalance to be aware of. Metabolic dysfunction in terms of uh, low blood sugar, we call reactive hypoglycemia. Um, 
enzyme polymorphisms, mutations, the MTHFR, many of you heard of this, happens to be involved in methylation, which is very important and can be very involved in autism and ADHD and mood disorders and, uh, and mitochondrial dysfunction. Uh, the mitochondria are those little subcellular organelles that uh, create energy and fuel the function of the cells in the body um, and is frequently uh, uh, frequently uh, is dysfunction in autism spectrum disorders as well as the mood disorders. Food allergies and sensitivities, again, nutrient deficiencies and insufficiencies and toxicants. Very, very similar to what we looked at in autism spectrum disorders. And so the approaches to these kids are very similar. It's an integrative medicine approach, trying to figure out what or if, and if there are what conditions may be contributing to the what we call the phenotypes, the presentation of symptoms. All right. So just remember that it's not it's not just anxiety and depression. It's OCD, panic attacks, mood dysregulation uh, at times with rage and even psychotic thoughts, and the symptoms may be mild, moderate, or severe. So what I, uh, you know, when we go back to the autism spectrum disorders, this is the old uh, way of looking at it before the uh, DMS, uh, the, the, uh, the latest one, number five, as opposed to the fourth one, right? So it's the, uh, it's the psychiatrist manual, SM four and five, all right? So this was earlier when they had Asperger syndrome, PDD and autism, I put ADHD, uh, because that, the approach to it is very similar. But these are, uh, the, the, the three to the right are, were on the spectrum. Asperger's was the mildest type. PDD was kind of in the middle and frank autism and low functioning autism was all the way to the right. Um, but after uh, this DSM-5 came out, they kind of bunched it all together in autism spectrum disorder. Um, and, um, uh, so that was, it was, it was a wider um, grouping, okay, and included all of them, still ADHD, of course. So what I thought of, and I thought a lot about this, said, how can we look at these kids? They're not on the autism spectrum, they are on a spectrum. They have lots of different uh, symptoms and diagnoses, and they have mild to moderate severe. So what I have come up with and I talk about this in the book, is the mood dysregulation spectrum, or MDS, okay? And I, uh, what I came up with is a way of graphing it. And actually, this is a graph that, uh, that uh, that's just a, a graph, it's not filled in. I'll show you some that are filled in templates for some of the disorders I'm gonna talk about. But you see here, the, the, the mildest uh, symptoms on the left, they go to the most severe on the right. So we look at um, irritability, moodiness, anxiety, OCD, progressing to depression, panic attacks, now from moodiness to severe mood swings with mood dysregulation, even at times with aggression and psychosis, all right? And I said a normal range, because, you know, you're, you know, listen, your, your teen and adolescent can have a, a normal amount of irritability, moodiness, and a little anxiety, maybe even a little OCD. Listen, most professionals, uh, to be really good at what they do, including doctors, I've got a bit of OCD and, you know, sometimes people are sad. I put that, in, you know, so I allowed for a bit of this in the quote, normal range, right? So there are some, and, and let me go back because this on braininflamed.com and that's uh, inflamed with a D, braininflamed.com. There is uh, blank graphs of the MDS snap, snapshot that you can actually do for your kids. And you're gonna see some of the questions and clues I, I have coming up. But, um, and you can then actually follow them as you go through some of the diagnostic and treatment protocols. And I don't, I, they're not really protocols, just like we used to say with autism, they're much more individualized approaches. But you, and then you can actually do it every month or, and see how it may change, how the symptoms may graph differently. And then I'm gonna show you some templates of some of the disorders. So, um, the, uh, so here's some clues and questions to consider. When did you first notice your child's symptoms? Was the onset uh, gra sudden or gradual? Was there any event or illness that might have preceded or precipitated the symptoms? Are their symptoms cyclic or protracted, prolonged? Uh, do their moods cycle rapidly from one to another? Do they behave very differently at home than in school or at their friend's house? That's a very important point. Um, okay. So again, 
here's these uh, MDS snapshots of, of quote normal. You see, there's some irritability of a teen and, ad and or adolescent. There irritability, some moodiness, anxiety, maybe a little OCD, you know, maybe a smidgen of sadness here and there. But you know, within this quote normal range, not everybody's going to be without any of these symptoms, and so it just gives you a sense. Uh, here's one of what I call teenageitis, where there's irritability, moodiness, and anxiety that uh, exceed the quote normal range. But this is a kid that when uh, who's, who's a bear at home, but when he or she goes to their friend's house for a sleepover, the, the parent tells you, "Oh my God, your kid is." Unbelievable. He or she, she is the most polite kid I've ever seen. Uh, just so sweet. And the same thing, of course, could be a boy. I'm going to use him interchangeably he or she. And then, uh, and then, and you say, are you talking about my kid? Because that child is a bear at home. That's teenageitis. Then about, then there's all these questions about gut dysbiosis. And I'm going to run through them in the interest of time. I'm not going to go through everyone. They're here, but the, the, the things would be diarrhea, constipation, alternating diarrhea, constipation, malodorous stools. One of my patients earlier this morning had severely malodorous stools. Sometimes uh, with the autistic, autistic kids, we would call, I call them house clearing stools. And some of your parents out there probably are shaking your heads because you know it. That is a clue to something going on quite significantly in the, in the, in the gut. Is there abdominal bloating? Were there frequent infections and antibiotics? Was the child born via C-section? Were there antibiotics given during pregnancy, labor, or delivery? Did the newborn receive antibiotics in, in the NICU for rule out sepsis? And does uh, your child crave sugar, carbs, junk food, uh, grilled cheese, sweet cereals, cookies, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And, uh, other clues and questions for Lyme disease. You know, where do you live? Where do you vacation? Should kid go to summer camp? Do they play outdoors a lot? Do they play sports like soccer? Uh, do they run around the grass? Do they hike? Have there been tick bites or bullseye rashes? Have there been, in, in addition to the psychological symptoms, swollen or painful joints, fatigue, brain fog, headaches? Have they had a flu-like illness in the summer? And have there been, in addition to the bullseye rash, are there these like little reddish, purplish, and they can be pretty large, stretch marks in, in atypical places in the middle of the back, for instance, or behind the knees, which would be seen in Bartonella. And here you see the template that I put together. And again, this is a template. Not every kid's going to look exactly like this, but I was just trying to give um, parents, and the book was written for parents, uh, educators, and mental health providers, really. Um, and I was trying to give a feel for like Lyme disease, where you can see, I mean, a varied symptomatology and sometimes really bad symptoms, especially Bartonella with the aggression is called Bartonella rage. But in Lyme, you can see all these anxiety, uh, irritability, depression, panic attacks, mood swings, et cetera, and even psychosis in some of the severe cases of these. Um, and you have to remember with uh, kids uh, and adolescents and, and, and young teens, you, the only thing you can see in them sometimes is neuropsych symptoms. You don't see the fatigue, the headaches, the joint aches and stuff like that. It may only be neuropsych symptoms. And then can they have PANS, PANDAS, or TABI, where basically it's an autoimmune disorder and you, do the symptoms appear uh, almost abruptly almost overnight? Where there, is there a history of uh, sudden onset of tics or OCD that can maybe wax and wane? Did they have a behavioral regression where they act much younger than their age? Did their handwriting uh, regress so it became difficult to, uh, to read and their drawing skills deteriorate? We call it dysgraphia. Did they lose their ability to do math? We call that dyscalculia. Did they all of a sudden start wetting their bed? We call that enuresis or having frequent urination without any evidence of a urinary tract infection. And has your child become hyperactive or lost his ability or her ability to pay attention and concentrate or have previous ADHD symptoms suddenly worsened. That suddenness really, and we have kids that overnight, they go to bed, a kid who's just this, uh, you know, great kid with, you know, gets along in the family with siblings and parents, has, has friends, is doing well in school, is a really good athlete, wakes up in the morning like an alien. Totally different. That's a clue to this autoimmune brain inflammation. And here you see mild to moderate uh, pans pandas, 
where you'll, you'll see anxiety, especially OCD, and I don't put ticks in here, that's a neurological, these are only psychological, and then uh, some depression and maybe panic attacks uh, with, of course, irritability and moodiness. But then a severe case, you can see uh, severe mood swings, aggression, and uh, even psychosis. And kids will have visual or, and or auditory hallucinations. And the aggression can be severe. They can, be, they can become suicidal. They can become homicidal. It can be very, very scary. And there's a, it can be a real concern for people in the house. Can there be a thyroid disorder? And again, the symptoms that may clue you into that are fatigue, uh, weight gain, small bumps, the chicken scratch bumps on the sides of the arms or the uh, tops of the thighs, uh, feeling of being cold and others aren't cold, hands and her feet, constipation. And, and sometimes the kids have elevated cholesterol levels and sometimes that's genetic, but sometimes it's because of thyroid. And here you see the snapshot of thyroid hypothyroidism. And usually the main things here would be depression and some anxiety. And then in terms of adrenal dysfunction and a reactive hypoglycemia, is there any shakiness, fatigue, or lightheadedness or irritability when a child doesn't eat uh, for an extended period of time? That can be hypoglycemia. Uh, does food help the symptoms? Does, uh, does he crave sugar and sweets? Uh, do uh, eating sugar or refined carbs and sweets affect their behavior? Just the patient I saw today, clearly uh, sugar, uh, saw the kid for ADHD, and clearly it was sugar. Uh, and, uh, and I think probably you also have to watch out for processed and artificial uh, food additives. But in this case, is the, is the child chronically low energy? They complain of weakness and brain fog. Do they get dizzy or lightheaded upon standing? Uh, and is there any trouble sleeping? Some of these can be seen with adrenal dysfunction. And here's a snapshot of adrenal dysfunction. You see anxiety, depression, but also panic attacks can be seen with uh, adrenal dysfunction. So remember I said you, uh, you have all these stresses and the increased stress of the uh, pandemic isolation and, and loneliness. And we have, all, uh, we have so many kids more and more just overflowing, uh, brewing and overflowing uh, with angst. And so this stress actually causes inflammation. And so there are a number of articles here I'm just going to show to, to support that, that the uh, systemic low-grade inf inflammation is stimulated by chronic stress. And so you can have a transient uh, systemic inflammation from acute psychosocial stress, but, when they, but with more increased levels uh, and adverse psychosocial uh, uh, stress, and uh, more chronic, you can get uh, adverse psychosocial uh, states or conditions such as depression, lower self-esteem and lower self-compassion even from stress causing inflammation. And here you see it in graphic form and various stimuli, not just psychological stress can cause uh, the release of these inflammatory mediators, but traumatic brain injury, toxic metabolites, especially from the gut, autoimmunity, all these things plus psychological stress can cause the, uh, uh, the release of these dams and PAMs, um, which are uh, a danger associated molecular patterns, um, pathogen associated molecular patterns. They can activate the various cells in the nervous system other than neurons, microglia, astrocytes, and oligodendrocytes, and they release various kinds of mediators. Again, remember the, the cytokines, the immune messenger molecules, tumor necrosis factor alpha, but other things, inflammatory prostaglandin, reactive oxygen sp uh, species, i.e. oxidative stress, among others. Okay. And here you just see where those, uh, um, that stress can cause a peripheral inflammatory response with these pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, et cetera going up to the brain, causing chronic neuroinflammation, upregulating the microglia and astroglia, producing more and more inflammatory mediators. And here you see the graphic, it's almost like the stress is watering this bush, but this is not a healthy bush, unfortunately, with these pro-inflammatory cytokines and factors, but causing degenerative diseases and also these uh, mood disorders that I'm talking about. All right, so the physiological underpinnings uh, very similar to, to that subgroup in um, uh, autism spectrum disorders, but this is for mood disorders, are systemic inflammation, dysregulation of the gut-brain immune axis, and brain inflammation, okay? So ultimately brain inflammation 
which can underlie and contribute to the psychological symptom presentations. And this is just studies on uh, adult rats looking at restraint, stress, so you restrain them and it causes them stress. And it, it basically in, induced uh, um, alterations in the permeability of the blood brain barrier. And I'm gonna talk about that in just a few minutes because that's how I'm gonna end the lecture because I think it's very important, the involvement of the blood brain barrier and neuroinflammation. And again, this res restrained stress was associated with inflammation, what I just said before. And here it's just, again, mention of this S100B. It's a calcium binding peptide, which is a small protein produced mainly by astrocytes in the brain, one of the supporting cells in the brain. And recently emerging evidence has suggested that S100B could be a new and non-invasive marker of blood brain barrier function. It also can show some sometimes some brain issues, but uh, I'm, I'm looking at it more as a, a non-invasive marker of uh, blood brain barrier function. And so we're going to move to the neurovascular unit and this function of this is the unit that comprises the blood brain barrier. And when this is dysfunctional, um, that uh, it uh, contributes to blood brain barrier hyperpermeability or an increased permeability like a leaky blood brain barrier. And that this allows inflammation into the brain and understanding the contribution of neurovascular dysfunction with blood brain barrier hyperpermeability uh, can contribute to the pathophysiology of, of, of depression, major depression, and also help to identify novel therapeutic and preventative approaches. That's the whole idea that I want to get across to you that just giving antidepressants, it may help a lot of kids, don't get me wrong, but that's not the only answer. That understanding these other things may uh, lead us to uh, other therapies that may be uh, even more helpful. And this is especially because remember that approximately one third, 30% to one third of people with depression don't respond to the typical antidepressants. So let's move to the blood brain barrier. Okay. And what that is, that's a highly specialized cellular inter interface between the blood and the periphery and the outside uh, of our bodies and the CNS parenchyma, which is the central nervous system mainly in the brain. And so generally the blood-brain barrier refers to the vascular barrier where capillary endothelial cells are the interface between the blood and brain parenchyma. What that means, and I'll show you the next slide, so I'll show you now a lot of graphics to help you see. So basically your arteries come from the heart and, they, and as they move out in the body, they get smaller and smaller and they get arterioles, and then they eventually get these capillaries. Capillaries are where the action is. They're, they're very tiny. They're one cell. Uh, it can fit like a, like a one bl red blood cell, and that's why you want them to be flexible. That's why flexibility and resilience is so important, not only to our whole the human being, but also to our cells. So the, in the capillaries here in the brain, this is what comprises the uh, blood-brain barrier. It's not only the, the capillary, and here, and I'll show you some other slides to show you even more, but it's the surrounding of that little capillary. These endothelial cells are one cells that line this very tiny blood vessel. They're surrounded by other cells called pereocytes, by basement membrane, and actually astrocyte feet, supportive astrocyte uh, feet, um, and as well as uh, neurons are right there as well. So this is, that's why they call it the neurovascular unit. I'll show you some more that are clear. Here it is again, you see it. You see that capillary, you see these tight junctions. These are very, very important tight junctions between these endothelial cells that line this very small blood vessel. And here you see, a, uh, it's a white blood cell in there, but there are also red blood cells in there. And um, here you see the astrocyte, a supporti uh, supportive cell of the nervous system to the neurons. Um, and you see the astrocyte feet supporting the blood brain barrier. Um, and here you see parasites. These are other cells that uh, support uh, around the basement membrane. And here you see the microglia. These are the immune cells in the brain. And of course, here you see the neurons and the astrocytes connect both to the neurons and their synapses, as well as the blood brain barrier and the vessels. Okay. So the blood brain barrier has, uh, it's, it does more than just 
divide the brain from the peripheral circulation. It's also critical in maintaining homeostasis in the central nervous system and providing nutrition, brain-body communications. And there are various ways that this happens via, uh, via diffusion and also uh, uh, active transport, which I'm going to show you. So very busy slide. You're not going to get tested on this. The only reason I kept it in here is to show you the complexity of what happens at the blood-brain barrier with things entering the brain from uh, the blood, including uh, glucose to, to fund energy, uh, amino acids, various ions, et cetera, and uh, waste products and, and, and products of metabolism have to come in from the brain into the capillary to get kind of excreted. There's a lot of active efflux. So there's diffusion, which is passive, but there's also a lot of active e efflux. You see here these ATPases, sodium potassium ATPase and many ATPases. These are things that here you see them again. These are uh, enzymes, they require energy. And that's why there's so much mitochondrial activity around the blood brain barrier, because you have to fuel the energy to keep, to keep it working, to keep it functionally an optimal level. And in fact, just as in autism, where mitochondrial dysfunction is, is prominent in a lot of children with autism spectrum disorders, it, it's the, it, it can be the same way in mood disorders. And this is just an article saying we conclude that mitochondria are key players in blood-brain barrier permeability and keeping the blood-brain barrier integrity, maintaining its integrity and functioning properly. And here's just a schematic. When the blood-brain barrier is disrupted, there's these tight junctions here that are disrupted and it allows the passage of inflammatory immune cells and larger immune globulins in to wreak their havoc on the uh, central nervous system in the brain. And so I already showed you that it's a selective barrier. It's allowing water, gases, nutrients, uh, glucose, amino acids, um, and you're providing the brain the essential substrates for energy generation, protein and nucleic acid synthesis, maintenance of proper pH and electrolytes, all that is needed for homeostasis. But on the same token, it limits the passage of inflammatory cells, antibodies, neurotoxins, and other molecules that are in the blood from getting into the brain, all right? It's a very dynamic barrier. Now, in the past, it used to be looked at that the brain and central nervous system were immunologically privileged and that not, nothing could get in. It was absolute, right? But more and so kind of like this impervious to anything like that just this you know stone castle so to speak that you know nothing could get in well current thinking is that there is immune privilege but it's not absolute it's relative and it's ascribed to the blood-brain barrier in the past it was thought to prevent but now it's more looked at as controlling and modulating the impact of what happens in the periphery in terms of peripheral immune events on the brain and central nervous system. From either perspective, the blood-brain barrier acts to protect the brain from peripheral immune event events and the inflammation. But again, remember, it's relative. It's not like the stone castle. And that integrity of the blood-brain barrier, as I showed you on the schematics, was maintained by these those tight junction complexes between the adjacent brain capillary endothelial cells and changes in blood-brain barrier permeability are correlated with changes in these tight junctions. Again, here's another nice schematic. I think this is helpful for you to see. The capillary you see here is endothelial cells with a tight junction. See how tight it is? Surrounding supporting structure perius, uh, parasite, a basement membrane, the astrocyte feet that are supportive, the uh, neuron, okay, and of course uh, the uh, microglia uh, and the macrophage, which are cells from the immune system. Here you see it again, very detailed. I, you, again, I'm, I'm not going to dwell on this, but this is a tight junction, and these are proteins that maintain it: claudin, occludin, as part of the zonulin complex. And very, very interesting. It's very similar to what happens between the one layer epithelial cells of the gut, of which we need to have proper uh, permeability. Not, we don't want too much permeability here between the cells. And if we do get too much, you, you've heard what it's probably called, it's called leaky gut. And so here I'm just showing that 
very, very similar, doesn't it look like similar between the epithelial cells of the gut, you see here the villi for absorption, and the endothelial, the endothelial cells uh, that separate, you know, the blood from the brain. And here's, of course, the, uh, the epithelial cells separate the intestinal lumen from the blood. And again, they have the claudins, the clutins, uh, and these tight junctions, okay? And under those epithelial cells in the gut are all these immune cells. And I think probably many of you heard, and if not, it's really, you, you need to hear this, 70 to 75% of immune cells are located beneath, in, in, in the gut, beneath the epithelium. And that's because they have to deal with so many uh, antigens, so much coming out of the gut that um, they have to decide, is this okay? Is this benign? Is it a friend? Is it a foe? Do I have to react? All done instantaneously. It's just amazing that it works as well as it does. And in addition uh, to all those immune cells, it's the microbiota in the lumen of the gut that uh, are very important and that they actually regulate uh, the microglia in the brain. They regulate microglia maturation and function. And microglia impairment can be rectified to some extent by complex uh, my, the microbiota, which is another name for the microbiome. And here's a, a, a paper that says, if you take, uh, if you add to a germ-free adult mice, mouse, you add a pathogen-free gut microbiota, so the healthy gut microbiota, right? Like probiotics based without pathogens, you can decrease blood-brain barrier permeability and uprate, regulate the expression of tight junction proteins, thereby enhancing the integrity of the blood-brain barrier with, with good intestinal bacteria. The, the microbiome uh, is so important and so powerful. And this is a really great article by uh, Fiorentino and as well, and Bui, uh, Dr. Bui and Fasano, uh, two uh, pediatric GI uh, from uh, in Massachusetts, who are brilliant. Fasano has just done some incredible work with uh, celiac disease, but he's also gotten involved in terms of autism and the whole uh, blood brain barrier and intestinal epithelium barrier alterations and how they relate. And here you see basically um, uh, concluding that our results seem to point to a dysfunctional gut brain axis associated with neuroinflammation and autism spectrum disorders. And basically, when you cluster uh, together by functional groups, the barrier properties, pro inflammatory markers, and enzymatic activity, our data support the notion that in ASD, there is a differential regulation of the pathways associated with our hypotheses of a gut-brain axis dysfunction involving the intestinal barrier, the blood-brain barrier, integrity and function, and neuroinflammation. It's a very, very important article, a very, very powerful concept. And this is true for the mood disorders as well as ASD. I'm trying to show you how there's so much correlation here. And here's just an article about the gut microbiota and autism and how basically the gut microbiota affect the immune system via various signaling pathways. There's this bi-directional interaction between the gut uh, microbiota and the brain. Um, and inappropriate stimulation of the immune system disrupts brain function through different mechanisms. And most importantly, modifying the microbiota alterations via these psychobiotics, which are probiotics that can affect uh, mood, could reverse the ASD-related behavior. This is an autism. And a very, very similar thing with neuropsychiatric disorders, the same thing basically, saying that uh, gut microbiota variations can play a critical role in the pathogenesis of neuropsychiatric disorders and application of modulators of the microbiota gut br uh, brain axis, such as symbiotics and specific diets, usually uh, more like uh, low carbohydrate diets, healthy diets, protein, uh, vegetables, good fats, uh, can be a promising strategy for neuropsychiatric disorders, kind of like a Mediterranean type diet. Okay, so here's another schematic I put together, basically with the uh, where you see the uh, gut-brain immune uh, axis, bidirectional communication between each of these, the gut, the immune system, and the brain, and then I modified it basically to put the microbiota in the middle, which affects all these systems and is very, very important to the proper functioning. It's something I call gastroneuroimmunology. 
another schematic just showing you this uh, disruption of the uh, paracellular tight junction and things can go through the cells as well and the importance in the blood-brain barrier of things going both ways, influx to the brain and efflux are out of the brain. So this slide shows what can contribute and cause blood-brain barrier breakdown. And I want you to know this, then we're gonna go into treatment. Um, it, uh, reactive oxygen species, oxidative stress, these inflammatory uh, enzymes, uh, matrix metalloproteinases, uh, inflammatory cytokines we've talked about like that, like tumor necrosis factor, uh, alpha autoantibodies, antibodies to self that shouldn't be there and various pathogens can do it too. And then of course, immune cell extravasation getting through the blood brain barrier and then secreting more inflammatory uh, molecules that make it more permeable. The characteristics as we've talked about all these increased permeability, reduced tight junction protein expression, uh, impaired transporters, uh, insufficient clearance, uh, detachment of the parasites, the supportive cells, loss of the astrocyte uh, end feet, and of course, disrupted basement memories, all the th parts of the blood-brain barrier. And the consequences are uh, microglial, astroglial activation, entry of toxins and pathogens, leakage of plasma proteins, including uh, uh, globulins, imbalance of ions and, and transmitters, and release of these inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, ultimately resulting in neuronal dysfunction neuroinflammation, and if neuroinflammation is present for long, long, long times, you can get neurodegeneration, which you don't want. That's why it's so important to get all this so early. To, if, if there's inflammation in the brain, we want to catch it early so we can help reverse it rather than let it progress. And here again is just another schematic showing you the breakdown of the blood brain, of the uh, tight junction. This is by the uh, matrix uh, metalloproteinases, but also you see reactive oxygen species and various adhesion mo molecules that then allow the entrance of these inflammatory uh, immune cells and immune globulins, okay? And what is the blood-brain barrier protecting? It's protecting the cells I've talked about, the neurons with all their different antigens, the astrocytes with all their different antigens, and here you see the S100 which is the S100B protein that I was talking you can measure, and the microglia with its antigen. This is what the blood-brain barrier is trying to protect. And here's a schematic which uh, shows starting in the gut, uh, stress, various infections, drugs and, uh, and, and chemicals, uh, dietary proteins and peptides like gluten and casein from dairy can all induce immune, uh, mucosal immune dysregulation in the gut causing the release of inflammatory cytokines like tumor necrosis factor alpha, IL-6, we talked about that, IL-1 beta. It uncouples the tight junction and then allows inflammatory molecules and mediator to get through. And these then get through and go to the, uh, to the systemic circulation in the brain and they induce inflammation in the blood-brain barrier, causing that tight junction to loosen and allowing the transmigration of these inflammatory Th17 cells and also uh, large immune globulins, et cetera, causing all this inflammation in uh, the brain. Here's another way of seeing it. You see here with all these, again, the MMP9, the adhesion molecules, and they're also interleukins, the uh, inflammatory cytokines, they all, they, they make, the blood-brain barrier, uh, they open the tight junction and they allow the penetration of these immune cells when they shouldn't uh, get in, okay? I think the schematics are, uh, can be very helpful. That's why I put so many in. And then this is just an article about the S100B. Uh, it's a calcium sensor protein uh, that, multi that impacts multiple signal transduction pathways. It's widely considered to be an important biomarker for several neuronal diseases, as well as blood-brain barrier breakdown. So, and I, I can measure that now, and you'll see it elevated, and it makes us really, boy, we really have to attend to the blood-brain barrier as best as we can. And here you just say you measure it, it gets through a disrupted blood-brain barrier, and you can measure it peripherally. There are other things peripherally that can contribute to it, uh, 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 adipocytes or fat cells and torn muscle, um, but generally it's thought to reflect coming from the brain. So let me see, I have a just, uh, that, so we just go to PANS PANDAS now and I'm, then I'll get to treatment and I'll, uh, um, fairly quickly, but I, I, I wanted you to understand the, the, this whole importance of uh, inflammation. 
Um, in pans, pandas, uh, this is about increased blood brain barrier permeability and the importance uh, of infection, such as a group A strep infection, like uh, a strep pharyngitis, a sore throat, for instance, and its role in opening the blood brain barrier. This is studies in mice that put it in their nose, but reflected uh, 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 strep pharyngitis infections and its role in opening the blood brain barrier and allowing these larger IgG uh, immune molecules to penetrate the brain. And also it activated, so in, in, in the nose of the mice, the strep, the group A strep activated these inflammatory Th17 cells that traveled through the olfactory bulb, which is, th which is through your nose and, um, and into the brain um, and opening the blood brain barrier that way. So upon opening the blood-brain barrier by these activated Th17 cells, the, then these IgGs, the immune globulins, anti-neuronal antibodies, antibodies that are directed towards um, the antigens in the brain that are on those various immune cells can penetrate and potentially lead to sydenham chorea, which is part of a rheumatic fever type thing, and pandas. And Again, the role for inflammatory medias in psychiatric illness has been identified in both kids and adults. And in addition to the direct action, uh, inflammatory medias have also been thought in pants to create a breach in the blood-brain barrier that permits these neuroactive autoantibodies uh, and inflammatory cells to reach the neuronal tissue, uh, that such mechanisms may indeed be critical in pants is suggested by the efficacy of anti-inflammatory th therapies, mostly most commonly ibuprofen or Advil and uh, steroids in attenuating the symptoms of uh, pan pandas or this, this uh, infection triggered autoimmune brain inflammation. And, um, and some, we treat with that. And this is just an article, this is one I use quite a bit. It's called, uh, it's a, a COX-2 inhibitor, uh, uh, Celebrex or Celecoxib. And basically, it can it can help in psyche in treating psychiatric disorders that have neuroinflammation, and it's been shown to hasten the onset of the effects of common therapies. Um, uh, so, if you use it with an antidepressant or maybe even with a, a mood stabilizer, you may get a, a quicker and, and, and more full response because you're addressing the uh, inflammation. And, you, and there have been studies with ibuprofen and naproxen. We definitely use ibuprofen. I like the COX-2 uh, Celebrex because there's only twice a day, not three times a day. And it's a, a selective one. It's easier on the stomach. And here are these antibodies that you can get actually that show, uh, and this is ele this is severely elevated picture, which is consistent with uh, autoimmunity and brain inflammation. This is called the Cunningham panel. We look at various autoantibodies and, and how they can also contribute to this increased enzyme activity, CAM kinase 2. So there are tests that we can get to support the treatments we need to give. And this is very important. This is a, an article came out a couple of years ago, intravenous immunoglobulin for the treatment of autoimmune encephalopathy in children with autism spectrum disorders. And I use a lot of IVIG in my office. It's very effective. It's a very, very, uh, it's the most intense treatment I do. It's, it's a high dose IVIG, so it's over two days. Uh, it's, um, IVIG is unfortunately uh, expensive. Uh, and it's, it, we will certainly lo love to have in the insurance companies will cover it because it is such a helpful therapy when there is autoimmunity and brain inflammation. And this article supports it. I do it a lot for PANS, PANDAS, uh, and basically infection triggered autoimmune uh, encephalitis, we call it, because that's what it is, brain inflammation. But this is talking about it in autism spectrum disorders. And overall, the majority of parents of the patients treated with IVIG found the treatment beneficial and believed that the benefits outweighed any adverse effects. You can have side effects. You can have uh, headaches and vomiting a day or two after. Um, it's a blood product, so it has to be checked for everything. Um, and you need to give fluid. So we have ways of trying to minimize those adverse effects, but clearly they're there. It's something you don't just do. You have to uh, really be a candidate for it. But um, uh, despite the limitations of the study, um, you know, it wasn't huge, but it was certainly, uh, uh, I, I think the number was, if I'm not mistaken, 82. But um, 
Our study verifies previous reports that suggest that IBIG may be useful in individuals with ASD who demonstrate biomarkers of immune abnormalities. In other words, they have elevated CAM kinase or, uh, or autoantibodies. If they have immune dysregulation, if they're part of that immune dysregulation subset, then they very well may indeed benefit. And I've seen benefits in various areas, especially speech. I've seen IBNG help, uh, help speech, help uh, mood dysregulation, certainly in kids with the mood disorders with tics uh, and OCD can be extremely helpful. Okay. And this is just talking about the emerging link between autoimmune disorders and neuropsychiatric disorders. And that what we currently diagnose as primary psychiatric disorders may in fact be due to definable treatable autoimmune syndromes. And then that dealing with the blood brain barrier uh, is very important in various psychiatric disorders, including schizophrenia, autism spectrum disorders, and mood disorders. Okay, so I'm going to run through how we can shore up the blood brain barrier. Basically, it's reduce inflammation uh, by anti inflammatory diet, nutrients, and herbs, maybe even anti inflammatory medications, enhance antioxidant function, heal the gut and the intestinal permeability. The uh, uh, healthy bi microbiota are crucial, support mitochondrial function reduce and manage stress, adequate exercise, and get adequate sleep. Now that sounds funny, but a lot of the kids like that I see don't, you know, may have sleep disruptions. And here just an article supporting exercise and blood brain, uh, that it's, it diminishes blood brain barrier permeability. Uh, this is resveratrol, which is a phytochemical. It's the, the part of the red wine paradox. It's, uh, uh, it's, um, it basically, and obviously we're not talking about red wine for kids. But it is a uh, phytonutrient that uh, is anti-inflammatory, antioxidant activities, and it protects the base, basement membrane integrity uh, and improves it. It's also helpful in Alzheimer's disease, actually. Uh, it reduces neuronal inflammation and restores the integrity of the blood-brain barrier. And um, yes, so it, it can basically, just by helping the blood-brain barrier, it limits infiltration of inflammatory agents in the brain. Vitamin D. This is a study of multiple sclerosis, but vitamin D uh, suggests that it might protect blood brain barrier function. Melatonin can uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, improve the, uh, enhance the blood brain barrier integrity by inhibiting that inflammatory MMP9. Curcumin is very, very anti inflammatory. It has COX 2 uh, uh, down regulation properties, just like the, the Celebrex I talked about. And it it's extreme, has a number of different uh, ways that it does its anti-inflammatory action. Um, and there's various studies supporting that, okay? NRF2, uh, there are supplements that, uh, that are combination supplements that can enhance the expression of NRF2, which is a, an anti-inflammatory antioxidant pathway, sulforaphanes so one of them. The combination we use has uh, green tea, pterostilbene, um, and um, uh, curcumin. And then CBD, uh, cannabidiol can also, interestingly enough, it's very anti-inflammatory and it may modulate endothelial and epithelial barriers and ameliorate cognitive defects. So this is the non-psychoactive component of cannabis and we use it. We have a pharmaceutical grade one from uh, hemp and it's very, you see all these uh, uh, mechanisms of CBD and it decreases pro-inflammatory uh, mediators uh, in the brain, downregulates the microglia, uh, uh, enhances plasticity and um, bone der uh, brain derived neurotrophic factors. So uh, it's it can be very helpful. We use a lot of CBD. It can help with anxiety. It can help with uh, ADHD, agitation. Um, it can help sleep. And so this is a paper that just says. Uh, so a lot of clinic, preclinical and clinical data support the involvement of the endocannabinoid system in these uh, pathogen, uh, in these several psychiatric disorders, and that uh, there are numerous studies that suggest that pharmacological modulation of the system might represent a novel approach for treatment. And these are you're talking about in uh, mood disorders, anxiety, uh, PTSD, depression, bipolar, and, and suicidal uh, uh, suicidality, as well as psychosis and autism that uh, the uh, CBD can be helpful. And again, we use a CBD without any THC. It's high grade, it's pure, and it's, uh, it can be very helpful. And literally, this is just another thing 
supporting uh, that anti-inflammatory antioxidant and that this is a novel perspective in autism research and it can represent a novel target option for autism pharmacotherapy. And anti-inflammatories can be helpful either reducing the blood-brain barrier permeability or directly uh, reducing neuroinflammation and sleep. Uh, chronic sleep loss uh, uh, can induce uh, uh, changes in the blood-brain barrier, making it more permeable, uh, more permeable and decreasing the integrity of it. And uh, there's several studies to show that. But the good news is that uh, the blood-brain barrier dysfunction after six days of uh, uh, cr chronic sleep restriction was reversed after 24 hours of recovery sleep. So if you get that good full day sleep, you can help uh, yeah, improve your uh, uh, blood-brain barrier uh, integrity. And this is just talking about uh, trying to promote resilience as opposed to stress and, uh, you know, finding uh, more therapeutic targets to treat this mood disorder, depression, and promote resilience. I think resilience is such an important concept in cellular and human health. And again, and that the, the uh, promoting blood brain, and, uh, blood brain barrier integrity and the uh, health of the neurovascular unit uh, it can help stress resilience. Okay, so basically this is the conclusion the blood brain barrier plays a vital and nuanced role in normal brain function and the evidence is mounting for its involvement in a number of neurological disorders in psychiatric disorders where multiple and seemingly disparate systems and functions can be affected. The role of the cerebral vessels and blood brain barrier may be far more important than previously proposed as the entire brain may be made more vulnerable uh, um, basically rather than just uh, specific cell types, okay? And so these are the last slide. Uh, 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 recognizing, understanding, and uncovering the medical biological underpinnings of neuropsychiatric conditions where psychological symptoms may be the only presentation allows one the opportunity to change the trajectory of not only the adolescent teen that is being treated, but that of the entire family as well. Let me emphasize that if you only treat these quote psyche, neuropsychiatric disorders that may indeed have some medical biological underpinnings, then you relegate that adolescent teen to a life of psychotropic meds and therapy. But if you actually figure out what may be contributing, you get the opportunity to change the trajectory of his or her life and that of the entire family. And that's probably one of the most gratifying things that I do in my practice. Increased permeability of the blood-brain barrier is an important contributor to the pathological process of brain inflammation and recognizing the importance of the gut-brain immune axis, the impact of the microbiota on the integrity of the blood-brain barrier, as well as the effect of diet, stress, sleep, toxicants, and nutrients informs therapeutic approaches for shoring up the blood-brain barrier, alleviating inflammation, and ameliorating symptoms. And this is all really, a lot of this is contained in my new book, Brain and Flame, that just came out three weeks ago. Um, and I think if you have any questions, it has chapters on the immune system, on the microbiome, and each of the disorders that I talked about is a chapter. So it explains it in lay terms. It's written for parents, for mental health providers, uh, for educators, so that we can help to understand this concept so we can, we can evaluate and diagnose these kids sooner um, and, and thereby uh, uh, figure out what may, if it's there, it may not be, but if it is there, help us to figure out. And there are a lot of clues and questions, not for diagnoses for a parent reading it, but for potential paths to take, avenues to pursue, to maybe get those proper diagnoses and treatment. And this is just my contact information. And I wanna thank you uh, very, very much. Uh, it's been my pleasure. Um, and I'll take questions if there are any. Thanks, Dr. Bach. <clears throat> we do have a lot of questions, so there's still a lot of people here. So we'll squeeze a few in here. I know that uh, people are moving on uh, with their days, but I appreciate you making a little extra time today to answer a few questions. The first question, and there are several questions along these lines. You talked about Cunningham panel and different testing that people can obtain to try to identify these different um, brain symptoms. Where can a parent or a, an individual on the spectrum find a clinician who 
can administer those? I mean, typically, how would you help somebody who's not in, in the New York area? So if they're in California, where, how would you tell them to find somebody who could well, give them that support? That's a good question. You have to find somebody that has expertise in this. Um, you know, it, sometimes you can't go locally. I mean, that's the truth. Sometimes, you know, I think there, um, sometimes you can look at some of the, uh, I think the Autism Research Institute, I don't know if they have any lists of uh, physicians. Uh, you know, we used to have lists that the problem, you know, the problem is knowing which physicians may have the expertise. I think one thing you can do, I mean, go online and, and, and search and look at their credentials and look at what they've done. I mean, one of the nice things that's happened um, uh, now, it's one of maybe the positive things from COVID is obviously there's been a lot of negatives from COVID, but uh, from our point of view, we can now see people from, I, and I've seen people from all over the country in the world, they had to travel to see me always because that's how it is in medicine, you have to do an exam. But now because of COVID, you can actually do video uh, telemedicine uh, first and, and I'm allowed to prescribe medicine and, and get the testing without seeing somebody which has been really helpful for people from far away from all over the world. So it's not just me, but other doctors too, who know this can do similar. So I, I think, um, I don't know if there's any really, uh, you know, uh, in terms of the autism, I think the, uh, the MAPS group has some doctors that would be more aware of this kind of uh, approach. And um, there are some integrative medicine organizations and you just have to try to, you know, to find the one that you're comfortable with and that you trust. It really, it really is a matter of trusting and being uh, comfortable with their expertise and the way that you relate and how you go about this. The next question is about COVID. So people are asking about individuals on the spectrum or with these other issues that you've talked about all these related issues. Um, how is COVID playing out in those patients? And, or have you seen any patients or heard anything in the medical community about that? Well, I think, um, I think mainly a lot of the kids who get uh, COVID thankfully are asymptomatic, thankfully. But I, I do think that COVID is very inflammatory. So if you already have this whole brain inflamed, the neuroinflammation and systemic inflammation, COVID has the potential to make it a lot worse. And, uh, you know, that's why that people have to, you know, get, get into this thing. Uh, you know, that's where um, you don't want to get COVID when you're inflamed. I tell that to all the patients with autoimmunity. Um, and, you know, obviously there's, a, there's vaccinations out there um, that, can, that can help because, you know, you, you really, uh, theoretically, COVID, well, COVID does increase inflammation. The lucky thing is in kids, it seems to, in many kids, it, it, it's tolerated, but there are some kids who also get severe inflammation. And, and, and it's not only, I mean, obviously people with comorbidities in terms of obesity and hypertension and diabetes are, and, and immune abnormalities are much more at risk, but it's not only those. COVID can, can, can really, uh, really, really increase inflammation. So the potential is it to make this worse. And that's why I, 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 I certainly want my, my patient to be protected against COVID. So what about psychobiotics? You talked about those, you mentioned that. Can you talk a little bit more about that? People had questions about exactly what that is and-, and Oh, it's just, it's just probiotics that um, if you look at very, various, I mean, it's probiotics that have uh, effects on mood and there, there are a number of different ones. So it's not like any one specific one, you know, and they have a study that looked at this or that. Um, I, I think, that's why they're called psychobiotics. They have a psychological effect. I, I think one of the keys about, especially in autism spectrum disorders, but in mood disorders, uh, we you have to use it. When I talk about supplements, uh, you know, when I use just like the pharmaceutical CBD, I use pharmaceutical grade supplements. You have to uh, uh, make sure that the probiotics are really high grade. Out of all the supplements out there, fish oils and probiotics have to be really of the highest caliber, almost pharmaceutical grade. And you want high levels of the uh, probiotics and you want a diverse, you want to promote diversity. That's very important, in, especially in autism spectrum disorders, but always. And so there are various combinations and various strains, but you know, sometimes people go out and they get this really inexpensive probiotic. Oh, I'm taking probiotics. Well, you're not really, because what, you know, it, it, it's, you know, the ones we use are, uh, uh, 
but nitrogen packed, each one is individual. So when you take it, you're getting what it was when it was put in. There have been studies to show that by the time you get a probiotic, the way it's handled, if it's in really heat and this and that, it's minimal to any activity compared to what it says it is. So, and you just have to know that with probiotics, you want to get the highest quality kind of pharmaceutical grade and, and, and to promote a diversity of the microbiota. So that's why psychobiotics, it just means it's really uh, referring to various uh, probiotics that can influence mood. Okay, so you talked a bit about sleep and, and its impact on uh, the blood brain barrier when, when people are struggling. A lot of parents use melatonin and individuals do. Um, the parents are asking about just appropriate dosage. And I know that information is always on the bottles, but is there a general guideline about that or somewhere where parents can look for information? Well, I, about can, that? I, can, I, I can speak to that for sure. You know, it depends on the size of the kid. And, you know, you may start with a half a milligram. You may start with a milligram. Um, you know, adults usually start with three milligrams, but kids, you probably start little ones a half, you know, uh, maybe the larger kid, uh, a milligram. Certainly teens and adolescents, you can, you can start with three probably. Um, and sometimes you have to go to six. Sometimes you have to go higher, five milligrams, six milligrams. Sometimes if kids, if they're waking up, um, they get, they have some fall asleep and wake up. We have a time released melatonin that you can take, um, and it works through the night. So it may help with those awakenings. Um, and you saw that melatonin actually is one of the things that helps, uh, uh, enhance blood brain barrier integrity, blood brain barrier integrity. So, I mean, melatonin is a good supplement. I mean, you know, the side effects of melatonin may be that it, it, um, sometimes can cause really vivid or dreams and kind of, uh, disturbing dreams at times, and then some people can't take it. But, you know, most people do well with uh, melatonin. I think you can judge the dose by if there's any after effects in the morning. Kids wakes up groggy or whatever, then it's obviously too much. All right, so we're gonna ask one more question. Uh, this person is asking about teenageitis. So just to clarify, is the, they're asking is teenageitis basically teen angst, the garden variety stress that most teens go through? Is that what you were describing? Yes, yes. I mean, I love, I love exactly right. It's, it's, it's garden variety. It's a teenager who's moody and irritable. Why? Because they're a teenager, and you know, and that that's the point I make in this, hopefully, in the lecture and in the book is that I am talking about all these things that can contribute to neuroinflammation and mood disorders. Every disorder I named, and I showed you all the templates I put together and stuff. But the bottom line is, sometimes they're just a teenager. You know what I mean? And, and you know that by, especially when they're really, really, you know, bears at home and not too bad in school or, you know, uh, and really great with their friends and, and at their friends' parents' houses, you know, and sleep, you know. That's when you know it's teenage itis, yes. And, and, and that, that'll make you breathe a little easier. Right, and maybe take a, take a step. I mean, being aware of all of these other issues can make us all look for these issues, for sure. <laughs> yeah, I don't want anybody, I, it's, yep. my intention in doing this was not to make people crazy by any means. In fact, I think it's, you know, the key is that you, uh, awareness is always key. But, but I, I make very clear, I hope I made it clear today, but I make clear in the book that, you know, it's not always one of these things. It, it, some kids are just have psychological issues. They're getting bullied. They had a breakup. There's a uh, there's terrible uh, marital discord. You know, all that kind of stuff. I mean, that could do it. But but if you're not aware of these things, and if you're not aware of the clues and questions that I bring at the end of every chapter, all those things I showed you are there, so uh, people can can look at them. Uh, you, you may not think of what may be causing it, and and you want to think about it in the sense not to obsess about it, but because we want to be able to diagnose these things earlier, because if they're causing brain inflammation, we want to be able to get to it sooner rather than later. That's the whole premise of my book. So we can change the trajectory of those kids' lives. 